what inspired author Andrew Sakovsky's fantastical characters on the continent such as the elves and Sylvan. Where can you find a real-world equivalent of a film set from this episode? Welcome to Breakfast in Beauclair's Around the Table, a segment where we go around the Beauclair breakfast table with other Witcher content creators, sharing facts and tidbits about the production and real-life history, folklore, and culture behind an episode of Netflix's The Witcher. This week, we're diving into episode 102, Four Marks. Hello, it's Anita from Witcher Kitchen. Do you sometimes want to know more details about the selected hero? Well, Sapkowski intentionally left gaps in his works. In the interview in Historia e Fantastica, Sapkowski stated that he doesn't have a diary hidden somewhere in a drawer in which he wrote down the characteristics of the characters and their biography from beginning to an end, or such details as maps, history and religion. As he says, if something about the character is not stated in the book, it should be so. However, he added that if someone wants to convert a book into an RPG, he's free to give each character special features, like hair, eye color or whatever he wants. Such a statement leaves the open path and wide possibilities for the creators of the series to answer the unsaid things about the characters, and this new information in the light of Sapkowski's words doesn't have to be considered bad at all. Thanks to this approach, we can even discover a deeper, more detailed story of Yennefer's fate than in the books. For example, where we get the episode about her story before meeting Geralt. This way, Netflix series can fill the gaps with new puzzles, but the ones fitting into the already set frames, so the audience can better understand the particular characters from the books. Hey, this is Ziprand from Berlin. Have you wanted to visit the Tower of the Gull? Well, I might have something aesthetically similar for you in our world. Well, not a tower, arguably the opposite thereof. The Paris catacombs are nothing for the faint-hearted. These former quarries underneath Paris are filled with orderly arranged human remains, tunnel systems to get lost in, and creepy tales of occult meetings and missing people, and have some strikingly similar, let's say, interior design choices to the place where Yen meets Istrid for the first time. Hi everybody, this is Charlotte from Vengerberg Glamorai. One of the real-world, traditional laws of magical practice, the Law of Equivalent Exchange, is referenced heavily in this episode and throughout the books. The Law of Equivalent Exchange seems pretty simple, but it can be very complex and pretty dangerous. Everything has a price. Magic conserves a given level of value, and a given effect must be paid for with something of at least equal worth. Part of the fun of magic, where this applies, is making absolutely sure you understand what you are paying before you seal the deal. This is why Frangilla's hand shrivels up because she did not focus on what she must exchange. This is why Tessaia says, sometimes a flower is just a flower, and the best thing it can do for us is die. This is why all sorceresses are made sterile. For power, you pay a great price. The sorceresses of the Witcher world are trained to follow the law of equivalent exchange. Hey, it's Lars from Witcherflix. Geralt and Yaskir are meeting Torka the Sylvan in this episode. Did you know that this creature is based on fauns and satyrs of Greek and Roman mythology? That they are spirits of the forest and appear alongside the god Dionysus or Bacchus in Roman mythology respectively. He is the god of wine, harvest and festivities, or as you could say, sex, drugs and rock and roll. Satyrs are also depicted as goat-like. By the way, the Sylvan from the Witcher world could have gained its name from the Latin word for forest, which is Silva. Hey, here is Carolina from Witcher Kitchen. The Witcher world is devised not only in monster species, but also in races inhabiting the continent and the languages used by individual characters as benefit every fantasy world. The topic of the elves was also introduced for the needs of the Witcher stories, but also at the same time, it was a Sapkowski tribute to Tolkien and his work with language of the elves. What connects the Witcher elves with this from Middle Earth? First, female names, which usually end of eel. Ale, e, l. The second thing is the language itself. Sapkowski used a database prepared by Tolkien and then added to this speaks of real languages, which are ear friendly from Polish speakers, like Latin, Italian, French, and English. Sapkowski also spiced up the elven language with cultic additions, as according to him, in Compose Wealth with the Elves. Hey, this is Brett from Whispers of Oxenford. It might have been a creative decision, but the ending of this episode is very different from the source material. In the story The Edge of the World, Geralt comes across a peasant girl named Lil in aid of sorts to an old woman of the village. Later when Geralt is about to be executed by Philavandril, Lil returns, but in this time in her true form as a literal floating goddess. 
Dana, the queen of the fields, who orders the elf to release the captives. Maybe this is a way of secularizing the story, as I have always wondered the implications of having a legit existing goddess present in the world. Thanks for sharing breakfast with us in this installment of Around the Table. The Witcher universe has so much to uncover. Let us know in the comments below what you found interesting from today's segment and if you have something new to share with our Hansa about this episode. We'll see you after the next episode of Breakfast in Beauclair.